So I'm really thrilled to, to um, bring up here um, one, of, one, of the, uh, one of the foremost practitioners of poetry um, we have to, uh, today. Um, and also one of the just nicest, most down-to-earth, open, and smart guys you'll, you'll meet. Um, so you know him um, from the bio book, and uh, you're about to know him even better in person, Robert Wrigley. Thanks, Julie, and thank you all for being here this delightfully rainy morning. It never rains in Idaho in July. It just doesn't do that. So. Uh, I thought about actually giving a lecture. I have a whole bunch of things that might be called lectures or might be called essays or, and are, in fact, some combination of the two. Uh, but I would really rather not. I would rather extemporize. I would rather just talk about poetry. I would rather than answer any questions you might have about the, uh, about the art, about the practice of it, about the process of it, you name it. I thought I might start, though, by, uh, by looking back some seven months, I guess, seven and a half months to January. I was in, I was teaching at San Miguel Poetry Week, a conference that happens every first week of January in San Miguel de Allende, Mexico. Uh, and I was doing a Q&A like this, and a young man asked me the sort of question that, uh, uh, well, one hears with some regularity, but one spends one's life trying to formulate an answer to. And that question was, what is the purpose of poetry? Uh, and I thought to myself when I answered it that if he had asked me that 20 years ago, my answer would have been a whole lot different than it was that day. And it probably would have been vastly more romantic than it was that day, because 20 years ago I was six. <laughs> uh, and, and, I, and I was, I think that I was 20 years ago, I was 41, 20 years ago. I think that uh, my, my art, my relationship to art was driven by a particular kind of passion, which is, as Yates would tell us, probably passionate intensity, which is not necessarily a good thing. Um, anger, a kind of rage at the world, a kind of discontent with the way the world works. And it's the kind of thing I think that young men particularly feel and are particularly driven by. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. I heard Philip Levine, or recent uh, poet laureate, great American poet, great American human being, say that uh, he has sensed in his own poems the kind of relinquishment of anger or the relinquishment of rage. And he felt some kind of energy leak out of the poems. On the other hand, he's 80 some years old. Now, if, if, you're, if you haven't kind of resolved certain things you're angry about by the time you're 80 something, well, dyspepsia becomes a real problem. So um, <laughs> anyway, looking back to San Miguel de Allende, when, when I was asked, what is the purpose of poetry, I said, and I, don't, I wasn't sure where this came from. It, was, it, I, it seemed at the time kind of glib, but the more I thought about it, the more it seems actually pretty accurate. I said, there are three reasons as far as I am concerned, or three purposes of poetry as far as I am concerned. And they are, one, to delight two, to instruct, and three, to wound. And then the more I thought about that, the more I realized that none of those are, in fact, separate from the others. That there's something about the way certain poems delight that also manages to instruct us and also manages to wound us. Um, and I don't think I'll say much more about that, but I wanted to offer that as maybe a kind of provocation. Um, so you might want to ask about wounds. I can show you my scars. Uh, or delight, or instruction, and so forth. But does anybody have any questions right off the bat? Or do I need to continue to just, there's one, bless you. There's two, there's three. Back well, back. And, and I feel like I'd rather hear you talk on a little bit before I start answering questions to you. But um, would you describe, if you can, if there is, um, how 
the generative poetry workshop, the generative processing workshop differs from the traditional model that we're all accustomed to in creative writing workshops? You bet. The, 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 did you hear the question? The, the workshop I'm teaching is what I call a generative workshop. That is to say, we actually produce writing in the, in the workshop. And I, I, I'm going to be real honest with you. I, I teach a lot of workshops. I've been doing it for shit. I forget. Going on 40 years, and that means a lot of workshops. As Billy says in his, I think it's in the poem workshop, wherever creative writing students gather in the afterlife, they gather in circles. So I, so I can't, it's like I can't function. I go to the doctor's office and I'm waiting for somebody to produce a poem. Uh, but I did, it's not that I'm tired of that process, it's not that I do not believe in that process, but there's something about hoodwinking, tricking, provoking people, writers, poets, into writing on the spot with a kind of prompt they have not seen before that can sneak up on them. I, I think, frankly, that there are probably a few people in the workshop, my workshop has been only once, that are a little skeptical of this process. And, and, and I don't blame them, uh, which is why when they write in class, I gave you too much time the other day. Less time tomorrow, guys. Uh, that is, I write too. Uh, and every now and then I come up with something that finds its way into a book later, that finds its way to publication. And that really surprises me. Um, as I said in the workshop, I don't know about you, but I, I, I've always discovered that writing is like the easiest thing in the world not to do. <laughs> uh, and Therefore, I have to be remarkably disciplined. So I suppose as much as anything else, there's a little bit of uh, bondage and, or discipline, uh, maybe both, in this sort of a workshop wherein we actually produce things. Nobody, uh, nobody has yet produced anything in any of these workshops uh, I've ever taught this way that's incandescently and immediate and immediately and clearly a masterwork, and yet I find myself, and forgive me, but I got a damn reputation here. I find myself regularly outwritten in these things. It, 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 it doesn't bother me too much. <laughs> a little bit. Is that, is, that a, is that an answer? Yeah, could you explain a little more about the types of prompts and, and how you choose them and, and the types of how the the, the process goes in a, in a normal workshop that you would conduct. How, what are the steps? In a, in a normal workshop, well, as normal, opposed to the current data. In, in a workshop that you would conduct, a generative writing yeah. workshop. Yeah. Well, I pick poems. I mean, I go, I go through my books and I pick poems, and I pick poems that generally are nothing like anything I would write. But they tend to be poems that I admire in some way, and they tend to be poems about which I think we can have a conversation, and I don't mean a conversation about whether or not we like the poem, I really don't care whether or not anybody likes the poem. The idea is to try to figure out what is it about the poem that works? What is it about the poem we're drawn to? What is it about the mechanics of the poem, the structure of the poem, the form of the poem? Uh, and we just talk about that for as much as an hour, and then take a short break, and then everybody comes back and writes proceeding from that poem. That may mean as it was yesterday, that someone someone just lifted phrases out of the poem and incorporated those phrases, in this case from a Mark Strand poem, into his own poem. Uh, it may be Strand's poem uh, is uh, uh, he, you know he's not a uh, a traditional formalist poet, but the opening line of this particular poem is is lockstep anapestic tetrameter. And, uh, and I wanted to make that observation to the class right off the bat and talk about what that kind of a lilting, it's a, it's a triple meter, da 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 in the shadow, in the shadow of domes, in the city of domes. Um, 
And I wanted to talk about what that sort of rhythmical opening does to the reader, how it pulls the reader in. He does not maintain that rhythm. Uh, that's not the point. But the point is that that sort of lilting rhythm really is a seductive thing. So a couple of people actually composed poems that had that sort of rhythmical opening. It's also a poem, it's, it's a poem called A Peace of the Storm. It's about, it's, it, there's a, a, an unidentified non pronoun I speaker in the poem who seems to be speaking to someone um, who is in the city of domes, in the shadow of domes, and sees a single snowflake come through a window, land on the arm of a chair and melt. So everybody, it's pretty obvious the poem's about mutability. The poem, I mean, it's an age-old uh, age poetic subject, but it's also after something else. It's kind of a very haunting conclusion. Uh, which I'm not going to spoil for you because you need to go find the poem yourself. It's really, re really kind of a wonderful poem, a piece of the storm. It's from the book of Blizzard of One. Uh, anyway, and then after 40 minutes or so, we go around the room and people read it aloud. Uh, and to demonstrate how, I mean, I understand how embarrassing that can be. <laughs> I didn't confess, as I confessed to my wife late yesterday, well, it was actually it was night, last no, night before last, uh, on the Amtrak, which we took because the plane could not take off out of Baltimore. Uh, that for the fifth time that day, I had gone to the restroom and discovered that that morning I had put my boxers on backwards. <laughs> I've never done that in my life, and I'm pretty sure I'll never do it again, because it's tremendously inconvenient. <laughs> and no one in any men's room or train wants to partially disrobe and turn his boxes around. So, and so they need not be ashamed. I just shamed myself in front of all my students. So let's hear it. What you, what'd you write? Okay? That's how it works. It's, it's true, and I'm, I'm not about writing a poem about having my boxes on there. <laughs> I think that would be delightful, I hope. It might be instructive. <laughs> the wounding was sort of in progress. <laughs> Other questions? So that's that your the definition that came out now. Some people were saying 30 years ago it would have been a very different, more romantic. Well, it would have been, I would have come down a whole lot harder on the world. I mean, I, and I still think that the highest aim any writer can have is to break the reader's heart. I mean, I, I, I love, who's, what's not to love about Shakespeare's comedies, what's not to love about the histories, which are frequently tragic anyway, but of course it's the tragedies that, that, that tear us open, that, that wound us in a way, although I do remember going to see the Mel Gibson version of Hamlet in the early 90s in Eugene, Oregon. I was teaching at the University of Oregon and uh, went to the can with my underwear on the, you know, in proper order. Uh, and uh, two young men came in. The one said to the other, God, I can't believe Hamlet died. <laughs> they, were, they were just destroyed by that. <laughs> anyway, I, I do think I would have come down a lot harder on wound than I am. But the fact is that the poems that, that wound us, I brought up uh, yesterday in class Philip Larkin's This Be the Verse, which most people love because it has fuck you up in it. They fuck you up your mom and dad. They get fucked up in their turn and so forth. Uh, it's the easiest poem in the world to memorize. But uh, that poem delights us with its formal intricacies. Um, it instructs us because it, it probably reveals a little more than we wish we might have known about Larkin. And maybe is a kind of win to, window into our own occasional, if not uh, frequent, misanthropy. And it wounds us a little bit by the recognition of that misanthropy within ourselves. Anybody who doesn't have a, 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 at least a bit of misanthropy in them, it's time for you to rise now and go out into the world and spread your gospel. <laughs>
But I, yeah, I, I, I thought I, I wanted, I wanted early on my poem. My poems never got laughs early on ever, and uh, uh, that's like a terrible thing to recognize you don't have in your poems. It's really hard to get it in too. It's really hard to write poems that uh, that can instruct and wound uh, and delight to the point of laughter. Other questions? Over here. Have you ever had a poem set to music? Do you ever do it yourself? Have I ever had a poem set to music? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, no, probably not very good. Uh, <laughs> I don't, you know, I, the song lyrics, I love song lyrics. Uh, you know, uh, Christopher Rick says that uh, Bob Dylan is the great American poet of the 20th century. He's the great American songwriter, maybe. Century. I'm not sure about that. I like Cole Porter a lot better than I like Dylan much of the time. Dylan's great, but you take the music, the melody, uh, away from Dylan's songs and just recite the lyrics, and, and some of them are really interesting. But uh, we were talking, well, it was actually during Billy's uh, interview with Dan Meneker, uh, talking about nonsense poetry. And the first thing that came to my mind was she came in through the bathroom window. <laughs> Protected by a silver spoon. Now she sucks her thumb and wonders by the banks of her own lagoon. I think that's pretty good. <laughs> but that wasn't really as good as McCartney's singing it with that lavish production uh, that's part of Abbey Road. So, uh, I, yeah, I, I don't, uh, I'm not, it, there's a huge difference. I'm absolutely, I respect uh, songwriters, and, and there are some poems that, that I think can be said to me. I think this be the verse. I wonder if anybody's ever said that to me. Mm -hmm. Sex pistols, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little too decorous for them. Star, you had a question. Yes, I, I, I was interested when we were talking about your influences, the two poets that you told me really Crap, who did I say? You said. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, the, the poets who influenced me, and we, I mentioned Richard Hugo and Madeleine DeFries, and they influenced me because they were my teachers. Um, and you develop a really uh, particular kind of relationship with teachers, but they're not the poets who probably had the greatest influence on me, finally. I mean, what, what your teachers do is give you a little satchel of tools. And it, it tends to be pretty compact. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm speaking, say, of my students, my graduate students in the, in the MFA program in which I teach. And uh, I, I want to give them as big, as big a toolkit as possible. Um, and, I don't, and I want them to understand that every tool, even if you only use it once in your life, is really, really useful. So I, I will not hear that I don't want to make my poems rhyme. I'm teaching a class in traditional prosody in the fall where I will make my graduate students write heroic couplets. <clears throat> it's hard on them. It's a lot harder on me, because I have to read them. And if you want to shame yourself, write heroic couplets, and then go read Dryden, and then go read Pope, and think, I'm not worthy. This is, this is way too hard. Uh, my. Uh, my influence is like everybody I've ever everybody I've ever read. Right now, I'm reading sort of obsessively Philip Larkin, including. <laughs> Was that a Larkin? <laughs> Larkin, you get the idea. Larkin never whistled in his life. Not that. Way. <clears throat> but uh, probably the poet who had the first profound, deeply profound experience or effect on me, was uh, uh, James Dickey, uh, who no one, no, I'm not going to say no one, the people don't read much anymore, I don't think. Um, <laughs> Dickey never whistled that way either, but he played the guitar. But, um, <clears throat> I had two teachers as an undergraduate who wrote dissertations on James Dickey, and they wanted me to love James Dickey. Dickey, in the mid 60s, early 70s, was like, I don't know that Robert Lowell wanted to admit it, but was really kind of the American poet of the 
of that generation. He barnstormed for poetry, did a lot of readings. Uh, he published in the New Yorker. I mean, if you go look at his poems, 57, 67, it lists all the poems in the New Yorker, and I think there are like 80 some odd in a period of less than a decade. Uh, so it was like a, a, a poem every other week. Uh, and some of his best poems. I didn't like Dickey much. One, I didn't like Southerners, which is not right. I didn't think I liked Southerners. I didn't like the South much. Uh, as far as I was concerned, it had everything to do with Jim Crow. It had everything to do with racism. Uh, and I just didn't have much use for it. But of course, that was throwing out the baby or the writer with the bathwater. I loved Eudora Wealthy. I loved Faulkner. I loved Carson McCullers. Lots of others. Uh, so eventually, I went back to Dickey and managed to find a kind of way in, and it, it mesmerized me for several years, which is what turned me on to uh, the possibilities of narrative in poetry. And my first, I sort of break my career, that part of one's writing life one manages, down into certain stages. At first, uh, I sort of became known as a narrative poet, so that every year I got invited to be on a, a panel at the AWP on narrative poetry until I finally said, no more! And I decided, oh, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. So I started pushing the lyric impulse. I started trying to make the poems as noisy and musical as possible, and until next thing you know, I'm always being invited to come and talk about <laughs> it. So I decided to quit doing that. And, and uh, I, I, it, it's connected to that notion of productive envy that Billy spoke of. When I find something that somebody does, as I did with Dickey, as I'm doing right now with Larkin, as I've done with so many other poets, that just dazzles me. I don't envy them, I envy what they managed to construct in words. I want to try to do that or I want to abscond with that particular tool that allowed them to do that to see what in my hands I can make with it. So influence is, is constant and fluid and, uh, and I'm always open to it. And there's nothing that I won't borrow from another poem. Yes, ma'am? I want to go back to the gym. Oh, there's your twin back. Oh, she left. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't Oh, it's you. Um, I want to go back to the generative workshop um, subject again. And we've got a very clear picture of how you conduct that workshop. I just want to finish off with that last step. When your vulnerable students reveal their bad poetry, <laughs> It was not bad. It wasn't anything bad. Well, I used to be that's just a right. Um, do you then again um, engage in conversation and comments and criticism? How does that differ, or does it differ from when from the traditional in the sense that here a stu the students walk in with copies of work that they have composed mm -hmm. over a period of time that they feel may or may not be finished? And then you are a generative workshop, and boom, this popped out. How does the following criticism among the peers differ or doesn't differ? There's almost no criticism. I usually respond with a sentence or two, a comment about that particular poem that the student just read, just wrote, and then read. Uh, but I'm also, I'm also having conferences with my students, and they can bring to that conference poems they've already written, poems they've brought, sort of to work the traditional way, get my comments on, my feedback on. Or they can take a poem that we've generated in class, tinker with it, revise it, polish it, and bring that in. And then we'll sit down and have a much more traditional kind of pedagogical gap session. So yeah, I do that too. What, no questions about Idaho? <laughs> yeah, empty. Last week, a week ago today, we were we my wife and I were camped. It was today Friday for the it, was, it would have been the sixth night in a row on a river. It takes four hours to get to from our house. Uh, it's on the west slope of the Bitterroot Mountains. 
Montana's just over the hump where we do nothing but fish. We get up in the morning. We camp out of the truck, so we have coolers with champagne and salmon fillets and <laughs> ahi and uh, a case of wine, some single malt scotch, some rough in, in other words, the sun is out. And then we go fishing all day, fly fishing. We catch them and we release them. Give them this sweet little ride. Uh, if they're big enough and handsome enough, my wife will give the fish a little kiss on the head before she releases it. Uh, I wonder what they think of that. So that's what I was doing. And that's what I'd be doing now if I weren't here. But this is, I'm glad to be here. Yeah? Uh, hey, Bob, this guy, a terrific model I was painting here a couple years ago, and he left behind this sheet that he had used to sort of guide himself. And he was giving his workshop about his own work. Uh, so, the sheet I have, and I was just uh, asking Billy what he thought of some of this stuff on the sheet. I was going to ask you what he thought. So he starts with these four questions. Is it essential? Is it disruptive? Is it cathartic? Is it broken? And uh, and then he has these axioms. The only way out is through the audience. Is why is it a movie? The truth is always more interesting. Do not fall up or you cannot put down. Any thoughts about any of that stuff? Well, the first, uh, the, uh, the four questions, the one that interested me most is the last one, is it broken? Uh, because I think there are sort of uh, sort of immediate answers to all the others. I can't remember. Is it essential? Well, by God, yes, I'm thinking about it. I'm saying it. It must be. Uh, disruptive and cathartic. Disruptive and cathartic. Cathartic, I mean, in a way, they're a little bit like entertaining or delight and, and instruction and, and wounding. Broken is sort of what is what interests me. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to wrap my wrap my head around it. I'm not sure what he might have meant, but uh, but it intrigues me. The idea of working with some sort of a broken idea or a broken form or a broken structural strategy uh, appeals to me a great deal, just because it offers up possibilities that might not uh, might not. I, I, I I'm not very comfortable with with uh, providing a kind of how to list. I can't imagine right, picking up a book and, and, I mean, even though that's sort of what I do is make my living telling people how to write poems or trying to show people how to write poems. It's, a, <clears throat> it's an uncomfortable place when you proscribe it and say, here's how it, how it is done, but I might suspect he's just offering up his way of doing it and it might work for you, it might not. You have to find your own ways. Right. Uh, I'm thinking it's with consideration what you said about the how to list. Um, just going back to the delight and struck and wound, um, it's come up a few times. And I was wondering maybe you can talk a little bit more about which one. And then maybe talk a little bit more also about how to put it together. Because, you know, I, I feel like I have a general sense of the definition of each one, and I have a general sense of how they can work together, but I think thinking about how it's come up a few times, you know, it can help me, you know, to, to feel out my feelings out there a little bit more and how they how those things can work. I'm sorry, Billy, I'm not gonna pick on you again. I'm not gonna, I'm not blowing smoke up his ass either. I just want you to know that. I uh, I'll go ahead, he said. <laughs> a very short poem. I think it might be four lines. No time. This is the, the poem in which uh, the speaker is, the well, way he doesn't have time, and he drives past the cemetery where his parents are buried and honks the horn. Wounded. But, the, the, and, and then imagines the rest of the day the father with that rising up with that stern look on his face about the time. What sort of behavior is that young man? And the mother just telling him to lie back down. All three of them. All three of those things, delight, instruction, and wisdom are located in that little tiny space. Uh, and it's pretty easy to see where that is, except when you start trying to break down well, this part is the delight, this part is the instruction, this part is the wisdom. They're all of a piece. And you're not trying to 
it's not it's not as though you, you get to a certain point and the tones, well I've delighted everybody, so now I'm gonna instruct them and when I get to the end I'm gonna <laughs> it's not that way. It's the cumulative, the cumulative product, and I don't, I, I don't, I don't think anybody writes with any of those particular things in mind at any given time. You're just you, you develop a kind of process. You develop a way of putting words on paper that works for you, and that you're able to go back to and figure out a way to enhance certain delightful or instructive or wounding elements thereof. Or find that, you, that there's not enough of a wound, that there's not enough delight. Uh, and, and build that in somehow. So there's that. Um, I was thinking also then, you know, I'm, I'm on Larkin again. Larkin's got a, a much longer poem called The Old Fools, which is delightful in, in, in a, a, a Larkner-esque kind of way. And I can't remember how it goes exactly. How did he do it, the old fools? <laughs> and he talks about the old fools who are pissing themselves. How do they do it? And then he stops and he says, when we die, we break up. And the parts that were us begin moving away from each other. And it turns into this strange and delightful philosophical thing. And then it turns, and the, the Larkner-esque bitterness starts to come back. And that, 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 that sort of voice in the beginning comes back. And you understand that Larkin's, in fact, as anyone would be, composing that sort of poem, looking at these elders, these old fools, and seeing himself and seeing the future, and uh, not relishing it. And that's the instruction, which is also the wound. Uh, and, and, and the delight is, the delight is in it. And this is, this is like a, it's like a, not an admirable quality in a human being, maybe, or a friend, but it sure works for Larkin and poetry. Uh, it's just cranky. He's not, he's not very nice. I think he was probably a, a, a nice man. Kingsley Amis uh, was a dear friend of his, although Kingsley Amis was, so far as I can tell, not a really nice guy either, unless you happen to be his friend. So uh, uh, that kind of misanthropy, that kind of bitterness uh, got filtered through these techniques that he had perfected for himself, which were formal uh, and structural and managed to delight us and instruct us and wound us. And you know, the number of poems that do that same kind of thing are just sort of uh, 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 astonishing. There's so, many great, there's so much great poetry. I can't bring myself to read crap, uh, by which I mean bad books. Uh, and I'm not talking poetry. I'm talking about you know cheesy. I do read detective novels when I go to Europe. For some reason, it's the only thing I can read. <laughs> diversion. Um, but most of the time there's just too much good to read. James Dickey, I'll go back to James. Sylvia Plath. Where does she delight us? Uh, Poppies in October, a little poem called Poppies in October, uh, which she wrote October, I think it was October. It was her birthday. It was her 30th birthday and sometime in October. It was her last birthday. She would kill herself in less than 100 days. She'd already written the poem on that day, that morning, getting up at 4 a.m., the poem Ariel, which is good enough for a lifetime. That would have made her career all by itself, a transcendent poem. But I like to imagine Plath toward the end of it. Her kids got up around 7 saying, I got time for one more. And it's short, it's, I don't know, I can't remember, I think it's eight lines. And it talks about the poppies, the poppies outside. Only the poppies outside could manage such skirts, I can't remember. And then uh, Englishmen, I mean, it, it, it's a very complex little poem. She gets toward the end of, this poem makes a turn, it's devastating. She says, oh my God, what am I? She needs it. 
She's writing two, three, four poems a day. She's absolutely manic. She's been either deserted by or abandoned by, certainly betrayed by her husband. She's raising her two small children. She's going to die in less than three months. Presumably she did not know that. There's evidence to suggest she did not mean to die. Uh, but she was at a place inside and a place of inspiration, which I believe in. Um, that made her wonder what in the world she was that these late mouths should cry open in a forest of frost in a dawn of cornflowers. <sighs> Do you wish you'd written that poem? It's like it's made out of plutonium. <laughs> Do I even want to pick it up? Is it delight? It does me, but the delight is the kind of delight that sort of wounds me. And it also instructs me. She's, she's a very important poet to me. And she was a very important poet to me when I was younger, when I, when I you know, that, that younger poet. I mean, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to take, I wanted to do like Plath. I wanted to take you right up to the abyss and make you look down inside. And eventually, I don't want to go there. If I find my way there, but I don't know that I want to dance at the edge of that particular precipice. It's unclear what the costs might be for me. Pretty clear what they were for her. I'm wondering if sort of on that little about my first book. It's called The Sinking of Clay City. It was published in 1979 by Copper Canyon Press. It's ugly. <laughs> they don't print ugly books anymore. Copper Canyon publishes like the most beautiful books in captivity. But for me, they made an exception. <laughs> Early on. Uh, uh, it, was, uh, it, it, was, it was an accident. I didn't mean that book to happen that way. And I don't know, if you, did you have in mind a, a book in particular, or this just a sort of generic first book question? Well, I think there's quite a few of us in here are going through that process right now. And uh, sometimes I've been talking to poets on poets, I think about 15 years to get there, but yeah. Um, it seems to just pop it out. And I'm sort of a poet that's a little hard to let go. Although I want to work on the next one. I don't believe you should start one book if you haven't finished right. one. And I don't believe you're finished with a book until you publish it, or until you get it sold. And somebody's going to publish it, then you can start it. I can't do that. I just keep working on the same project. Uh, there are, I've had this discussion with, with graduate students who are in this. We're trying to make a thesis, which is the basis for their first book. That's the intent, right? Um, and. And they want to talk about the difference between a collection of poems and a book. And the book they want to suggest has that, has an arc. You know, there's a reason this poem comes before this poem comes before this poem. That's architectural. It's got to do with the structure of the entire book. And I, and I, and I talked to them about that. I've tried, I've done that in a couple of books. I've, I've made concerted attempts to do that in, in uh, at least two of my books. Uh, and I discovered, you know, within, really within the last five years, that I have no intention of ever doing that again. Um, because poems get canonized, books do not. I mean, uh, name a book by Robert Frost. North of Boston. Well, okay, this is a tricky group. <laughs> But if you walk into the average department of English, let's say in a state university, and walk down and open up the doors one by one and say, I need the title of the book by Robert Frost, not including the collected poems. A boy's will. 
I know. <laughs> North of Boston, New Hampshire. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of. And this, if you guys, are, okay, I've got a room full of ringers. <laughs> but I, if I walk down the hall of my own Department of English and ask that question, there wouldn't be very many people who could give me a title of Aaron Frost's books. They could give a lot of them. Everybody. You can stop people on the street and probably get uh, a, the title of a poem by Robert Frost, because that's the way that works. So your ticket to immortality, and you're, not, you're still going to die. <laughs> but your ticket to that sort of literary immortality lies in writing a single poem, or a half dozen. Randall Jarrell said, if you got struck by lightning half a dozen times, you were a great poet. Half a dozen times. You were a good poet if you got struck once or twice. And the rest of us are just standing out in thunderstorms waiting. Yes. yes. Great big conical metal hats made out of tomato frames. So I, 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 I think first books are, are uh, for, for some of us, they're really hard. My, mine was an accident. Uh, uh, Sam Hamill, who was the founder of Copper Canyon Press in the late 70s, was in Missoula and visited a workshop that I was in that was taught by Richard Hugo. And uh, I had a poem, and Sam really liked it. Uh, it was a poem about growing up in, in a coal mine town. It was about my, my folks were all coal miners. And he really liked it because it's, like, it's left wing. It's uh, about working people. And he wanted to know if I had more. And I said, oh, I, got, I got about 15 of them. And he said, send them to me. And he wrote me back. He was going to publish a chapbook. And then a year went by, nothing happened. And another year went by, nothing happened. I wrote him and said, you want to publish that chapbook? And he said, nah, I don't want to do chapbooks anymore. Send me more poems. We'll make it a full book. <laughs> so I just did that. And I, you know, it was sort of the opportunity presented itself. And I did it. And I did, probably didn't think as much about it as I ought to. I know I did. I had a really shitty teaching job. I was teaching seven sections of composition a year and one section of creative writing. Uh, I had a brand new baby. I was, in a, I was in a decomposing marriage. Not the one for which I am celebrating my 29th anniversary today. Yeah. Just in case you do see my wife, she does show. Uh, she's, does, she's got conferences today. She'll be around. Uh, so I always think of my second book as honestly my first book, which I did toil over for about seven years. Uh, it did have three or four, it's called Moon in a Mason Jar. Uh, it did have four or five titles before that, each of which was, was uh, progressively more desperate. Uh, until I finally came up with, a student gave me this uh, Moon in a Mason Jar title. Uh, and, uh, and I did front-load it with what I think were the best poems. Um, and uh, it, it was hard. So really, it took me 10 years after I finished graduate studies to make that first book. And I don't think that's uncommon. And there's nothing wrong if it takes 15 or 20. Or 25. It's not how much you publish, it's how well you write. Anybody else? What time is it? What am I doing? Forgot to turn my phone down. Ten minutes? Anybody got a ten minute question? Ah, ten minute question. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to know a little bit more about your personal discipline, and you were talking about how easy it is not to write. So, do you kind of pursue ideas as they come? Do you write at a certain time regularly? And or generative workshop, do you use prompts for yourself? I, uh, I have a, a, a studio building I built myself, 12 by 16 feet off in the woods. We live in the woods. I walk off the little trail up to my studio building, which has a little wood stove in it, and about 4,000 books, and a futon, and a guitar, and two desks. And I put on a little music, nothing with words, usually jazz, sometimes classical, sometimes I'll put Bach, Bach, or Vivaldi, uh, usually jazz. Until I start to write, then I turn it off, I can't have anything. Even the birds are sometimes a little raucous. <laughs> um, 
I teach two days a week, and uh, I have reached that point in my academic career, uh, which is to say I'm long tenured and long a full professor, where I'm one of those guys that probably would be better off getting rid of, except I draw a lot of students. Uh, and because uh, I, I just don't do committees. Sorry. <laughs> That's why you're an assistant professor, because I'm not doing it. Uh, and I'm on campus two days a week. And the other three days a week, uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I'm out in that study. And I go out and I turn on the music. And I, if it's cold, I build a fire in the stove, get it warmed up. And then I sit down and I start putting words on paper. And I confess I'm actually now, uh, and have been for some time now, composing on the, the computer. Which I feel badly about because you don't leave a paper trail and you can't see the revision process. You can't go back and, and recover something. I print it off a lot, so I've got like boxes and boxes and boxes of, uh, of drafts, but they're all typed and they're, you know, they're, they're impersonal therefore. So I kind of regret that, but I, once you get used to doing that, it's like you know, getting used to a car with air conditioning. You've know, got to have it. Um, and, and I, I'm, I, I'm out there, what's well, a great little building. And, uh, it, it's, 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 it's got a name, you know, like vacation houses they used to name. Bob's Oasis, mine is stanza, which is also, of course, a, a, a word in Italian for room. It's my little, my little room. Uh, and it has a, uh, a urinal made from a trans mission fluid funnel and a piece of garden hose down into a little rock well, so I don't have to go inside uh, and I don't have to yellow up the snow. We have a lot of snow in my So I, I'm sure you needed to know that. <laughs> but it's one of my favorite things. Ed Hirsch was visiting, I think it was last spring, not, not this spring, but spring of 2011. First, Ed got really nervous in the main house there's bookshelves all over and he's looking and finally goes, Bob Jesus. He calls me Bob Jesus. <laughs> where are the skinny books? <laughs> okay, so I took him out to the study where all the skinny books were. And uh, um, so, yeah, I said, I could never write out here. All I do is look out the window at a hundred mile view to various mountain ranges. And, and uh, I, I don't think I'm immune to that view, but I do look out a lot, and I invite what's in, outside in the pond, so I get a lot of that stuff in the pond. Um, so you know, in, in that regard, my practice, my discipline is pretty easy. I, there it is. I, I've got three days a week to, uh, to practice this craft and maddening art, and, and a lot of the time uh, I, I put words on paper, and they don't really amount to anything I feel inclined to say. That's just called putting in the time. That's called putting down the words. Uh, I don't, uh, every now and then there are poems that take me a long time to write. There's a poem in my last book, Beautiful Country, called American Fear, um, which is a poem I'm, uh, I'm very proud of that poem. It's 220 some odd lines long. It was 600 and some lines long at one point, and I realized I had to slaughter about half of it, uh, which I, more than half actually, two-thirds of it, which I did. Um, and it took, it took almost, it took almost a year of intense effort off and on. I had to stop every now and then come up for air and work on something else, but the, that, that poem took almost a year of intense effort to uh, write, which no critic has been actually sort of aware of. Uh, they'd say, it's a poem about silly fears, but it's in fact a poem about the Republic. Uh, so it's, that's a little bad name, but <clears throat> as uh, St. Francis said, uh, fuck it. Maybe <laughs> said that. Isn't that Saint Francis? <laughs> anyway, yeah? Okay. You got one more, I got time. I got one more, and I'm nominating myself to ask it. <laughs> um, I know in Billy's workshop, uh, his students were doing an exercise in getting image down with, without metaphor. That's possible, kind of, that's strict to just the image, without the editorial. 
without thinking about what it is. Okay, so looking out your window and a lot of your homes are um, oftentimes an apparition of an animal or a, just a sort of natural image that's the star of the poem. Could you talk a little bit about the relationship between image, the thing itself, and metaphor? No, I don't think so. No. <laughs> uh, uh, well, you know, I, uh, as, as Plato uh, made pretty clear, the, the ability to make metaphor is the primary skill of the poet. And my sense of uh, imagery and the store from which I take imagery is the natural world in this place where I live. And there's just a whole lot of, I mean, if I lived in Manhattan, there'd be a lot of pigeons and cabs and subways and stuff, because that, that's what I'd see. Uh, where it is this, uh, where I live now, that's what comes into the poems. And it, it, uh, it seems to me that metaphor uh, generates itself from image that the, the, the deployment of image, of accurate description, uh, almost inevitably leads to the kind of metaphor-making act that Plato talks about as the, the hallmark of, of, of the skilled poet. And that's, uh, I guess that's all I really say about it. I, I think that, that some people are, some folks are, are uh, are in love with with certain kinds of figures of speech uh, and really good at it. I've got a, a, a graduate student now who, I mean, it, it's sort of a terrible thing to do, but I had to sort of dissuade her from being so simile happy. Everything was like something else. And frequently those similes were just arresting and remarkable, but they were so arresting and remarkable and so many that uh, eventually the poem seemed to be like something else and not the thing itself. Um, by which I mean I don't think that her, her, uh, her figures came about organically from the production of, of image. And I think image is, is uh, fundamental to it. Metaphors too, but metaphors a little harder to earn. Does that, yeah. that make sense? I hope so. I'm tired of hearing my own voice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can you hear our applause? Thank you very much.